Ah, that's true. Hello, class. Professor Davis Dyson here, proving that I can be two places at once. So today we are going to be doing the PowerPoint for Chapter 6 on the topic of sensation and perception. Don't let the terminology throw you. It's all good. Sensation simply means the awareness that some event took place within the environment. Perception is an interpretation or an understanding of that event. So I'm going to switch to the PowerPoint and basically you won't see my face a whole lot for the rest of this because uh, the recording process gets a little complicated when I try to switch back and forth. So here goes. All right. So what we see is the topic of sensation and perception is going to be covered uh, all covering all five of our senses as well as talking about perception. So the riddle of separate sensations gonna, as I always have done so far, skip the learning objective. All right, sensation, I've already explained it in my way, uh, but it's the detection by sense organs of physical energy emitted or reflected by physical objects. Perception, which I already have said is the interpretation or the understanding of the thing that just happened within the environment. Stated here, they call it the process by which the brain organizes and interprets sensory information. So the riddle of separate sensations, how do separate sensations kind of get perceived or get interpreted? First of all, the sensory, sensory uh, receptors are the cells located in the sense organs. They show a hand touching their pet kitty cat. So the sem sensory receptors in the fingertips, uh, they try to uh, make it easy for you to learn by calling that the scouts. But secondarily, after the scouts have uh, touched the fuzzy cat, the sensory nerve endings in the peripheral nervous system, they refer to as the field officers, transmitting information that the scouts have detected, have sensed. Ultimately, that information is sent by the field officers to the brain, the command center of the brain, where perceiving that the fingers touched something fuzzy happens. Now, this whole little cartoon process that you just looked at is the result of two processes going on. Uh, the anatomical codes and the functional codes. The anatomical, that is the anatomy, that is the body, that is the physical business. Uh, the anatomical code are signa signals received by the sense organs that stimulate different nerve pathways leading to different areas of the brain. So the signal received by the fingertip nerve endings. Then the other kind of coding is the okay now what code? What is the function of what I just touched in other words? So functional codes are particular receptors that will fire or not fire 
in the presence of certain stimuli. So the fingers touch the kitty cat, certain receptors that correspond to that kind of touch fire up and send information to the command center of the brain ultimately. Okay, this concept of synesthesia, uh, when you see S-Y-N, always think put together. So synthesize, in other words, or put together. And the E-S-T-H-E-S, -E think of aesthetics. Aesthetics is something to experience. So putting experience together is a way of understanding the word synesthesia, uh, but it's a condition in which stimulation of one sense also evokes another sense. So in touching something, it might cause the sense of what I feel to remind me of something that I have seen that has that feeling, such as my kitty cat or any of the other senses working together uh, as well. Could be an example. Okay, so how do we know that we've sensed something uh, in the environment before we get all the way to perceiving it, interpreting it, understanding it, First, we sense it, but some things get sensed and others do not. So when something gets sensed, it's because it has reached the difference threshold, which is the smallest difference in stimulation that a person can detect reliably. In other words, they can do that about 50% of the time. This difference threshold is also called the just noticeable difference. Sometimes uh, something is so fleeting to our sight, to our hearing, to our smelling, etc., that it goes unnoticed. Other times, ah, we think we just sent something, okay? That was the, as we just uh, saw, the difference threshold versus this is the absolute threshold where when we have the just noticeable difference, um, but we have noticed it, it has become something that we noticed, it's because we have reached the absolute threshold which is the smallest amount of energy a person can detect reliably at least 50% of the time. So it kind of sounds like it's saying the same thing because each one is about 50% of the time. But the difference between the two concepts is that the just noticeable difference, which happens about half the time when something takes place in the environment is therefore half the time you don't notice it. But when you do notice it, then it's because uh, it has become an absolute awareness of an absolute event that just happened. So they show us some examples. Um, in a dark night, in the far distance, um, it, it, it's in fact a far longer distance than you would otherwise imagine or assume. One can see a lit candle if it's dark enough outside. One can hear a ticking watch much further away. One's absolute threshold can be reached with those examples as well as smell, as well as 
touch, and taste. Uh, one can have an absolute threshold at a greater uh, distance or a uh, least audible, you know, etc. You get the point. So it's just pointing out the difference between, in the case of smell, one can reach an absolute threshold prior to to uh, being able to smell the fragrance of a rose. Signal detection theory, the psychophysical theory that divides the detection of a sensory signal into um, two types of processes, keeping in mind, once again, that we're studying sensation and perception. So sensation carries with it a process, and so does perception or a decision about what I sensed, uh, you know. So the sensory, uh, so the process, rather, of the whole sensation and perception in terms of sensation, it depends on the intensity of the stimulus. Is the smell strong enough for me to smell? The sight visible enough? Blah, blah, blah. You get the point. Is it obvious enough for me to pay attention to it? Okay, if so, if the just noticeable difference has been noticed, thus it becomes absolutely noticed, then that is because of the sensory process that has taken place leading us to the decision process. But the decision process is in part based upon the observer's response bias. In other words, two people, one person can perceive another person won't pay attention, won't notice, won't have uh, interpreted because they may not have even sensed it in order to interpret it in the first place. And an example of the reason one person may uh, sense and perceive versus another one could be the difference between um, being preoccupied. Something else is on your mind. You didn't pay attention. Um, and in some cases, that's good. People with attention deficit disorder can't focus enough to ignore. But if you are fortunate to be able to use what we could call tunnel vision or, you know, concentration is a better word, I suppose, uh, then that's a good thing. We don't get bombarded with everything going on in our world at any given moment in time. Now, this is showing sensory adaptation, getting used to a particular sensation. In this case, it would be the sensation of touch and possibly even the sensation of hearing the uh, tattoo guns, I guess is what they're called, at any rate, the apparatus used to, to uh, do tattooing. So the reduction or disappearance of sensory responsiveness when the stimulation is unchanging or repetitious. The point being in this particular example is the sensation of touch becomes not painful to people who, you know, get tattooed all over a whole lot, a lot of times, frequently, you know. Uh, those people, rather than finding it painful, frankly, find it um, comforting, 
soothing. They really kind of become addicted to tattoos. When we get much further along in the semester, I'll, uh, I hope to remember to come back to talk about why that is, but this is not the time to say more about that right now. But sensory adaptation can happen where you get used to something and uh, it no longer has the original effect or the expected effect that it would originally have. It spares us from having to respond to unimportant information. Uh, again, this is if you don't have ADD. If you've got ADD, you might respond to everything and anything, or at least sense it with whichever of your senses would be involved. This I'm going to uh, let you kind of do on your own because I know that these PowerPoint slides are also items from your book. So under the circumstances, I won't, I won't uh, bother with that. Okay, sensory deprivation is the absence of normal levels of sensory adaptation. Uh, the absence of normal levels, in this case, of uh, stimulating the, the, the sight, the, the, sense, the uh, sight sense, the visual sense. Um, and so this person is blindfolded, thus they have to use other senses to determine what the it may be in the environment that they can't otherwise literally see. Obviously, that's what a blind person has to do. All right. Sensing without perceiving is uh, kind of what I was talking about a moment ago. Uh, they call it selective attention, uh, focusing attention on selected aspects of the environment and blocking out others. And selective attention is both helpful and not helpful, it depends on how we use it. If we're using it to be able to focus on something and uh, tune out, turn off stuff that's otherwise taking place in the environment so that we can pay attention, for example, to the conversation that we're having with someone, then selective attention is, is great. If we're using it to pay attention to the professor and not look out the window of the door, the glass, to see who's walking down the hallway, uh, or you get the idea, uh, that's a good thing. But it's not a good thing if you are tuning out something you should be focusing on. Again, you understand. Inattentional blindness, the failure to consciously perceive something you are looking at because you are not really attending to it. Uh, so this is a way to think about this is daydreaming where your mind is somewhere else and it looks like you are looking in the right direction or looking at the right thing or looking at the professor as he or she is talking, but it's kind of inattentional blindness. You're really not noticing what he or she is writing on the board. You're really not noticing uh, the next page that just came up on the PowerPoint. Again, you understand uh, the point of inatten inattentional blindness. You're, you're clueless. You're out of the loop for a moment because you're just focused inwardly in your head on something else. And kind of in that same vein, uh, 
sensing without perceiving this obvious gorilla is a female in a gorilla suit carrying this whatever it is on on her back there but the point being one can be paying so much attention to the race that they are not aware of this person in the gorilla suit as being part of the race. For example, let's say you're a parent and you're focusing on this young lady here with the red headband and it's your daughter and she's doing pretty well and you're cheering her on. And uh, maybe rather than being on the side of the race where the uh, gorilla is, maybe you're over there on the other side, but you're focusing in on her, you could be inattentionally blind to the gorilla. Now, uh, continuing on, well, or starting on the topic of vision, but slightly differently uh, doing so, some of what we're going to be looking at is not going to let me get past this is not when we get to anatomical stuff I'm not going to dwell much on it because that's not going to be part of your your exam or quiz because it's more of a biology or an anatomy and physiology uh, than it is psychology but with regard to some aspects we will pause and so this is talking about the way in which we see color. Uh, we see colors in terms of the hue which is in other words the differences in you know one thing is red one thing is blue one thing is green so if we are not color blind we see things in a hue. Uh, we also see in terms of the richness of the color. So it's maybe the same color from light to dark. So how saturated is it? And finally, how bright is it? Same color, but one color comes across as brighter, or one shade of the same color comes across as brighter than another shade. And uh, so, this is one of the more biological and anatomy physiology pages that I won't focus much on except to say that the optic nerve that is at the back of the eye goes into the brain all the way back to the uh, occipital lobe and the occipital lobe is literally where you and I see. The eye is just the mechanism through which light comes and thus can be sent information can be sent through the optic nerve to the occipital lobe where literally sight is housed. Just pointing out how uh, what we see in the uh, atmosphere or in the environment rather uh, changes shape although it doesn't to us consciously we don't we see a pen like this is a ballpoint pen we see a pen we see a pen it doesn't change shape in terms of what we sense but it really is changing it, you know but it gets interpreted correctly so our occipital lobe interprets correctly what it is that we're seeing So, um, rods and cones, first we're looking at cones, cones being located in the fovea, uh, require light, and cones are the part of the eye 
that are sensitive to color. So were it not for our cones, we would indeed be colorblind. Uh, cones are how we interpret color, perceive color. Rods are about light, uh, perception of light, and they're located um, in in uh, our in the periphery of the eye, used in dim light and at night, and they are not sensitive to color. So our rods get fired up the darker the environment becomes. Our rods are called to action, if I could put it that way. So, speaking of uh, rods in darkness being called into action, uh, which is, this is what calls us to adapt. The longer we're in a darker room or darker whatever, uh, the better we can see because of the rods helping us see better. At first, it's kind of like we're blind until we adapt. So dark adaptation is a process by which visual receptors become maximally sensitive to dim light. You all know that after you leave a movie theater and go out into the sunshine, it takes a minute for your vision to readjust. Uh, the cones adapt quickly, so the cones don't have problems after you've left that dark theater um, knowing what color exists, what colors exist in the environment, in the theater and outside, but it takes a few moments longer for the rides to adjust. And just a hint, by the way, uh, uh, about rods and cones, just think of the C for cones and the C for color. So that will automatically help you differentiate which one is for light and which one is for color. There you go. Cone color automatically, therefore, leaves rods as being for light. And again, the various structures of the eye are not questions uh, that I'll be asking you on the exam. And this is an exercise where uh, if this were a piece of paper that you could hold your head still and you know, move the paper closer and further away, about 9 to 12 inches away from your face. If you move the picture of this magician and the rabbit, you know, you are supposedly no longer going to be able to see the rabbit uh, by having, I believe it's the right eye closed. So, why is our visual system not a camera? Okay, the neurons actively build up a picture of the world by detecting meaningful features. So, from the moment you and I were born, we began the lifelong process of learning what the world consisted of in terms of shapes and colors and, you know, the whole thing. Therefore, uh, our neurons build memory sets, memory connections about all of those geometric shapes and uh, colors and what have you. And so the neurons actively build up a picture of the world by detecting meaningful features. And those are called feature detector cells. 
located in the visual cortex that are sensitive to specific features of the environment. Uh, those feature detector cells are located basically in the cerebral cortex. The brain generally takes in fragmentary information and comes up with a unified view of the world, puts pieces and parts together. Uh, for an example, and I think to give you guys eyes a break, I'm going to switch it to me for a moment and just give you an example of that. Uh, when you meet someone, let's say you get introduced to an individual and you're told that person's name and uh, you hear that person's voice and you, of course, see how tall and what color of hair and whatever, whatever the distinctive features are about that person. And maybe you've been introduced to that person because you're going to be having occasion to run into her, you know, to, to interact with her uh, further uh, in whatever setting and for whatever reason. But uh, you don't see her necessarily every single day or, you know, but you are, your brain is building feature detector cells for that person. So in one part of your cerebral cortex is her sound of her voice. That's in your auditory uh, temporal lobe stuff. Another part is your occipital lobe. Your, audit your uh, visual processing uh, sees things about her, and you get the point. Every lobe of your brain has a part of that person stored away. So when her name is brought up again, your brain quickly associates and pulls together that person's various puzzle pieces in such a way that, let's just call her Mary, Mary, short, red hair, glasses, kind of a high sounding voice, you know, whatever else that your memory of Mary pulls together is the result of having feature detector cells working appropriately. Okay, back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so of all the colors that exist in the world, we basically get all of those colors from three basic colors of green, blue, and red. Okay? So that is the tri, tri means three, obviously, chromatic, chrome means colors, so trichromatic or three color theory, okay? The trichromatic theory uh, says that the retina contains three types of cones. Remember cones for color? So uh, there is a set of cones for green detection, a set of cones for blue detection, and a set for red detection. So unless we're colorblind, the opponent process theory says that the visual system treats pairs of colors as being opposing or um, antagonistic. Um, so basically the after images that we see as we're going to look at, I think it's maybe next, let's see here. Yeah, so what this is about, and you can do it on your own because all of you have the same PowerPoint that I've got, 
um, if you stare at that black dot for, I think they suggest about 20 seconds, which uh, I'm not going to do right now, but okay, if you do it for 20 seconds and then look at a white wall, this green and yellow heart is going to show up as reddish or pinkish on the white background. It's because of the opponent process of red and green being seen by our cones um, as being kind of opposites or fighting against each other or opponents trying to process a unifying color. Therefore, you look at the white wall and you will see red be the result or at least a pink if not an outright red. Constructing the visual world includes form perception, so perceiving or interpreting or understanding uh, shapes is form perception, as well as depth and distance perception, uh, visual constancies, and visual illusions. And we will look at all four. All right, so in looking at all four, form perception is under the notion of gestalt psychology. Gestalt psychology says that you and I see the world based upon figure and ground. I'm sure this is on your study guide that you will need to know those terms to fill in the blank. You and I see the world based upon figure and ground. Okay, fancy talk aside, that simply means that which is most important, that which is taking up the most space in our mind, in our lives in our concerns is our figure. Our ground is everything else that's less important, less impactful, less paid attention to at that moment in time or that period of time. Okay, with all of that said, Gestalt's principles are Principles that describe the brain's organization of sensory information into meaningful units and patterns. I know that background picture there is highly uh, uh, intimidating, quite honestly, but and, and those words might not be too far away from highly intimidating, but hang with me here and I'll break it down. Okay, so figure in ground. Immediately when you saw this page, you either saw a bunch of black fish or you saw a bunch of white fish. Whichever you happen to see first, there is no right or wrong, good or bad. It's just, you know, whatever you saw first probably was the blackfish because black jumps out from the entire page than would the white fish because the whole page is white. Your figure, your most important thing, your focus of the moment would typically, likely be the uh, blackfish, like I said already. So that would be your figure. 
Everything else, the white stuff, would be your ground. What is the point of all this, you could be wondering? What is the reason Gestalt psychology exists? The reason is, if you are a Gestalt psychologist, the focus of, and I'm going to switch it back to my face here for a moment, the focus of Gestalt psychology is Whatever is important to the person who comes in for counseling is that person's figure, that person's most important focus, that person's central uh, thing in their picture of life that they need to deal with. Let's pretend a person's figure is their mother, okay, I don't want to pick on mom, but okay, so not everybody gets along with their mother, or I could have picked on anybody else, dad or sister, brother, but okay, uh, to drive my point home, one person's figure could be mom, but maybe the sister or brother of that person whose main focus is problems with mom, and I can't stand it anymore, so I've come for counseling, Maybe that sister or brother of that person, their figure is not mom. Maybe they get along with mom just fine. So if they have life concerns, life problems, life issues, it, their figure will be something else or someone else. But it's not mom. So the same as, I'm going to switch back now, the same as some of you may have seen Whitefish, probably the most of you saw blackfish. It's because the most obvious thing of importance was the black fish. It just jumped out at you, but to someone else, the whitefish was their figure. I, I'm sure I've explained that to death, and I'll move on. Okay. Another Gestalt principle is that you and I tend to put together stuff for it to make sense to us. So uh, not only is figure and ground a Gestalt principle, so is the principle of proximity. Okay, so what you've got is obviously three rows of red dots, four in a row. And that's how our brain sees it. But the same uh, row of dots, if put together, you would no longer think three rows of dots. Let's, uh, in our heads anyway, put together those three rows so that you've got row one, row two, row three, but probably would be in the shape at that point of a square or a rectangle, but that depends on how close together or far apart as to whether your brain concludes square or concludes rectangle, or for that matter, they could be put together in a different configuration and your brain would see triangle. You get the point. And therefore, those blue dots are a kind of a rectangle shape. Uh, someone could call it a square, but uh, it looks more rectangleish to my brain, right? So how close something is together causes us to interpret that it means X, Y, or Z. You know, so again, let's move from this business on the screen to counseling. So you're in counseling, you're seeing a Gestalt counselor, and you believe that some people are working against you. Some people are scheming behind your back because those people are always together. And those people individually 
cause you to be a little suspicious as to ulterior motives. They appear to not really have your best concerns at heart. They seem to be not really your friend, even though they might sometimes be pretending to be your friend. But insult gets added to injury if and when you see those three people together. Now you know, quote unquote, know that they are scheming and conniving against you. Now, I'm not saying that that's not true. I'm pointing out, or it may be true, or it may not be true, but the point of Gestalt is let's work through what are some alternate explanations here and ultimately come up with an explanation that in all likelihood is the one that's the most uh, likely, the most logical one. And closure is yet another gestalt uh, principle where even though it's a part triangle, a part face, and an incomplete letter of the alphabet, we, our brains need to have complete pictures, and so we create a complete picture in our heads. Um, similarity. We want things to make sense in our world, in our lives, in our situations. So even though we really have dots and squares put together in a certain configuration, and at first glance we simply see a square with two different geometrical shapes. But our brain sees a fancy square, an interesting square. But really, when you focus on it, um, you just got a bunch of little squares together and a bunch of circles together. Or you've got stars that are solid and stars that are uh, empty inside and, you know, otherwise a rectangle. And I know that this is kind of so abstract and so, like, who cares? <laughs> that it's like, what's the point? The point is really, as I said already, to show that we humans are trying to make sense out of the, the stuff we see in the world, the experiences we have in the world. We're trying to fit them into something that makes sense. Even though the interpretation of what makes sense isn't always correct. And we continue, another principle, principle being that of continuity. Um, so we want on the right uh, to our brain wants to make a sideways figure eight out of what otherwise may not even be in reality a figure eight at all. Or on the left, we might want to make a one thing out of what really is two things, an oval on top of a straight line. All right. Depth and distance perception. Binocular cues are visual cues to depth or distance, and that requires both of our eyes. And for us to determine uh, depth, and we're going to see what that looks like. I think I think it's on the next page and our retinas see 
two different parts of what it is in our eyesight? Well, I'm going to get to it in a minute. I, maybe it's next since it wasn't this one. Okay, so binocular cues that we just looked at is about being able to perceive how far away something is, which is what depth perception is about based upon the cues in the environment. But monocular cues is not about the use of both eyes. It's about the use of one eye. Uh, visual cues to depth or distance, which can be used by one eye alone. And all of those uh, words in purple, I don't necessarily need to read, but it's showing that if you only had one eye for whatever reason uh, to view the world with, you could still accomplish the tasks that are listed there. Um, this isn't still where I'm hoping to land here in a minute, but this is a, uh, per a depth perception sort of thing as well as uh, interposition. So we can perceive that the balloon that is the largest and uh, is in front of the other ones let me back up. We can perceive that the balloon that is in front of the other ones is the largest. And we can perceive that it's the closest. So interposition, an object that partly blocks or obscures another one must be in front of the other one and is therefore seen as closer. Ah, okay. So Linear perspective, this is where parallel lines will appear to be conver converging in the distance. The greater the apparent convergence, the greater the perceived distance. Artists often exaggerate this when they are painting, uh, you know, uh, artwork. Uh, they often exaggerate this cue to convey an impression of depth. So relative clarity, because of particles in the air from dust, fog, or smog, distant objects tend to look hazier, duller, or less detailed. Yeah, the closer something is, the clearer something is, the bottom line to that whole thing. Uh, another depth perception uh, thing, uh, you, you can, uh, even if you were looking at this with one eye, you can, your brain understands that the clearer thing is the closest thing. The fuzziest thing is getting further and further away. Relative size, the smaller an object's image on the retina, the further away, farther away the object appears. So texture gradients, uh, we've got sunflowers that are easily uh, seen and understood up close. Further in the distance, if we didn't have the up close as a clue, we wouldn't necessarily, if all we had was the background distant sunflowers, we wouldn't necessarily say, aha, a field of sunflowers, because it could be another kind of vegetation that's also yellow. But we uh, put the two together, and so te texture gradients, distant parts of a uniform surface appear denser. That is, its elements seem spaced more closely together, uh, which is also, of course, uh, what happens further away, it, they seem to be packed tightly, but they're really 
not as you can see up close. Light and shadow. Both of these attributes give objects the appearance of three dimensions. Monocular cues to depth. Motion parallax. When an observer is moving, objects appear to move at different speeds and in different directions. The closer an object, the faster it seems to move. Close objects appear to move backward, whereas distant ones seem to move forward. So you know when you're sitting in a bus or a train or a car, I suppose, but there are no cues, no environmental cues because you're in an enclosed space. It will feel as though and look as though you are moving when in fact it's the object next to you that has started to move. So, seeing when it is believing, because sometimes seeing is not believing, as in motion parallax, for example, you are not moving. It's the object next to you, but you're whole brain and body are saying you're moving, okay? Until you get some environmental cue to tell you that you're still standing skip still. Uh, but okay, perceptual constancy is the ability to perceive objects as stable or unchanging, even though the sensory patterns they produce are constantly shifting. Um, so the best studied constancies are visual. Uh, so we perceive something as uh, being constant with their brightness, with their size, with their location, with their shape, and with their color. Um, and yeah. Just because it's further away or closer up, we still see this bright balloon as a bright balloon, you know. If it's a large balloon, we still see it as a large balloon. You get the point. The constancy in our brain about what we see is just that. It's constant. This is uh, just some more examples of things that really are best for you to just study all the ways in which either our brain does hold things constant in those cases where it does, and in other instances where we can trick the brain. We are fooling the eye in the case of these examples where it's not the, I suppose that's, I don't know, cats or dogs, I guess it's dogs. Anyhow, our brain is tricked, our eye is tricked first, thus our brain is tricked, because we think we see a small, medium, and large dog, or cat, uh, but what is happening is that the shape of the room from ceiling to floor is getting tighter and faking us out. And in this middle picture, we think we're seeing shorter or longer figures where in uh, certain examples of looking at all of them, some of them are the same size and how if you held your fingers up to your eyes really close, you're gonna see what is shown in this rectangle here. Trick the eye, trick the brain.
obviously, as I continue here, uh, uh, sensation and perception is one of the longer chapters, and I have to record this all at once, but obviously you can listen to it in more than one sitting because sensation and perception, though it's important, otherwise it wouldn't be in the textbook, is not as interesting, <laughs> quite honestly, as some of the other topics of the book uh, are. But now we're looking at hearing. And loudness and your uh, uh, study guides want two blanks filled in. And what I want you to put in the blanks uh, are the words amplitude and intensity. So loudness is about amplitude or intensity of the sound. Now within that uh, sound category of loudness, pitch is uh, what is, pitch is uh, the difference between, oh, bass and soprano, I suppose. Uh, what is the frequency of the sound? What is the pitch? Timbre, still sticking with sound, and I did say timbre, even though it looks like timbre or timbre, it, it is actually pronounced timbre. Uh, it is the, distinguish, the distinguishing quality of a sound related to the complexity of the pressure wave. Okay, simple English, simple English here. The timbre is the difference between a simple song such as, I don't know, Mary Had a Little Lamb or Twinkle Twinkle Little Star versus the timbre of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony or some other complicated piece of music, okay? And they give the example of a note played on a flute differing from a note played on an oboe, uh, and there the flute is just a simpler sound, an oboe is a more complicated sound. This, I'm going to just move past. It's showing the structure of the ear. Um, actually, actually, hold on. Uh, there was something here that perhaps I will cover it. There's something here that's not in the picture. That is, there's something on your study guide where it's uh, wanting you to fill in the blanks about, yeah, the basilar membrane in the cochlea. It, it also has another name, but I don't see that name on here. I believe it's the Isle of Corti. But I will double check on that. Just keep your eye on the email, uh, and I will also find out if it's in the book. It might be in the book, for all I know. Okay. All right, so an ear on the world. So we use perception to organize patterns of sound. In other words, we use our interpretation, we use our understanding about what sound is supposed to be to organize it into patterns because our, again, the Gestalt approach says our brain has to make sense of everything in the world, not just what we see, but of what we sense in every 
regard to all five senses. It has to make sense. So, um, we also need to know where our sounds are coming from uh, in order to help us estimate distance. And there's a reason we have two ears. Okay, using our two ears, uh, sounds from different directions are not identical as they arise at our left and right ears. Slight difference. Taste. Okay. Our savory sensations happen as the result of papillae and taste buds. Papillae are the knob-like elevations on the tongue containing the taste buds. Okay? And the taste buds are the nests of taste receptor cells. So, you all have had occasion, I'm sure, where you've had a bad cold, the flu, you weren't that hungry because your taste receptor cells were not working at optimal level and your smell wasn't working at optimal level because taste and smell go together. Thus, without them working sharply the way they are when you're not ill is the reason you don't have an appetite. But best case scenario, they're working well, unless not only, let me throw in, not only illness that could make them be dull in their sensory ability, it's also aging. Uh, makes them less sharp. Uh, food tastes much more obviously salty, sour, bitter, sweet uh, to children than it does to the elderly. All right? Um, it's especially sharp in children, but less and less so the older we get. So salty, sour, bitter, sweet, and umami. Umami is represented by some of the things uh, that are showing up in the picture. Uh, fish, for example, is none of the others, so there has to be another category. You, you wouldn't, I mean, sure, unless it's, a salty fish like, you know, um, um, anchovy or anything. But otherwise, just all by itself without having been treated in a salt solution, um, it's neither salty nor sour nor bitter nor sweet. It's umami. So, genetics do also factor into our taste preferences. Culture does as well. One thing that a culture likes that they even think of as a delicacy, you cannot imagine yourself wanting. Uh, you know, I imagine you can't imagine yourself wanting uh, to eat crickets or ants or other stuff that is just something that is not what you think of as food. But learning does factor into developing a taste for at least some things. Um, food attractiveness is important. If it looks good, if it's the right temperature for what it's supposed to be, 
um, and texture. Uh, I've met people who don't like certain textures of food. They don't like uh, maybe things like mashed potatoes or any other thing that's of a what they would call a mushy texture. They want more crunchy textures. Uh, it, it's it just in the person's DNA and maybe other reasons as well. Uh, odors, if, if the food smells good, you're going to be attracted to it. If it has a smell that you assume you wouldn't like the taste, a lot of people don't even try the taste. An example could be cabbage. Cabbage has rather a strong odor. Thus, some people say, I don't like that. You know, they're not willing to try it, you know. So, the sensation that causes us to smell, in other words, the sense of sense. Airborne chemical module, uh, molecules enter the nose and circulate through the nasal cavity. Vapors can also enter through the mouth and pass into the nasal cavity. Again, the mouth and nose work together. Receptors on the roof of the nasal cavity detect these molecules. And again, not going to spend time identifying parts of the whole thing. And now we are coming to touch. Senses of the skin. The basic skin senses include touch, warmth, cold, and pain. And touch could include pressure. The mystery of pain. There's a gate control theory that says the experience of pain depends in part on whether the pain impulses get past a neurological gate in the spinal cord and thus reach the brain in the first place. Um, this theory it is absolutely correct. Um, people who have leprosy, and maybe there are other diseases, but leprosy is certainly one such disease where pain cannot be felt, and initially one could think of that as a blessing, and I'm going to switch over to my face here. It could be seen as a blessing initially. Oh, wow, that person's lucky. They don't feel pain. They don't feel something that hurts. But that is not true. It's not true physically, nor is it true psychologically. Pain is your and my friend. It's because of pain that we end up going to the doctor for physical stuff, wherein they can discover what that symptom was really about, what is the cause of the symptom of pain, and thus uh, go about the business of making us well or treating us for that. Psychologically, pain is also our friend because you can get help to work through your otherwise psychologically debilitating issues. So people with leprosy who don't have pain receptors also don't have the tips of their fingers or the tips of their toes or the tips of their nose or other parts of their bodies have been uh, worn away or burned off or because they can't feel the hurt. So don't think of pain as a problem. Think of pain as your friend. Not to say that that feels good. It doesn't, but 
It causes us to do something. Okay, phantom pain is the experience of pain in a missing limb or other body part. So that is indeed true. You've probably already been aware of that. People missing something still, at least for a while, if not always, uh, at least initially, their leg that isn't there anymore still hurts. So the mystery of pain Um, okay, what is kinesthesis? It tells us where our bodily parts are located and lets us know when they move. Um, I know that that's part of your study guide, okay. On the other hand, equilibrium is what happens in our cerebellum at the, in the lower brain in our semicircular canals, it gives us a sense of balance. Uh, people who have dizziness or even worse, vertigo, which is like even worse than dizziness because it's horrid. Anyhow, are people who have momentarily lost or for a span of time lost their equilibrium, their sense of balance, they're dizzy. All right. Placebos and expectations affect the subjective appearance of pain through their effects upon... Um, so, they give some examples here of expected to get intense heat versus expected to get moderate heat but got intense heat or expected to get moderate heat and got moderate heat. What is the point of this? It's pointing out that this group of subjects involved in this experiment who got a placebo. That is, they got what they were told in the green group of people there. They were told they were going to get something very hot. So, they really didn't get something very hot, but they expected it. Here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. Now they get touched. Their experienced pain intensity was higher than the other two groups. The blue group were told they were going to get something that was pretty moderately hot, but not like scalding or searing, but it, you better brace yourself. Here it comes. Well, their intensity uh, was experienced based upon what they expected. And likewise, you get the drift. The last group were told you're going to get moderate heat. Uh, oh, the middle group, I'm so sorry. The middle group were told they were going to get moderate heat but actually got warmer than what they thought would be moderate. And so their ex expectation was for less misery, so they received less misery. And the expectation for the gold group of moderate, and that's what they got, well their reaction to what they got was lower in intensity. So what we expect to get is what we get. And if we get something that we're not expecting to get, we will respond um, lesser or greater. So the brain is very much involved 
the endorphin production. Oh, I was expecting super hot, but oh, that wasn't bad. So our happy chemicals bounce around up there because what we were expecting to have to brace ourselves for really didn't happen after all. So expectations about pain are also affected by our environment. All right, inborn abilities and critical periods. Many functional, I'm sorry, many fundamental perceptual skills are inborn or acquired shortly after birth. This visual cliff experiment, a very famous one, um, shows that a six-month-old baby seems to have been born with some level of depth perception or certainly has acquired it in six months time because they are crawling but they stop when they get to what their brain interprets as danger. I will fall if I keep going. So the baby keeps going. I mean, obviously, you can see that it's a glass top table, and the baby wouldn't actually fall, but their brain doesn't say that. Their brain says, danger, you will fall, stop. And that shows that they have depth perception. Their visual uh, development has the ability to perceive depth. If infants miss out on experiences during a crucial period of time, perception will be impaired. Infants have to be exposed to the world, in other words, to its, you know, way it works, to its dangers as well as uh, safety measures to protect the infant that the infant becomes familiar with. If they're not exposed to that, it's a critical period that will cause them to not be able to function in the world as we are supposed to function. Um, when adults who have been blind since birth have their vision restored, they may not see well because it's not just the seeing, it's the perceiving. It's not just the sensation of sight, it's the interpretation of what my sight is telling me about my environment. So other senses such as hearing may be influenced the same way. In other words, if we are not exposed to hearing early in life, but at some point later on we can hear, we may have very well missed an important critical period for perceiving what we are sensing in our ears, uh, the same as lack of sight brings about a deficit. Lack of hearing might bring one about as well. So psychological and cultural influences, we are more likely to perceive something when we need it. Kind of makes sense. We're more likely to understand, interpret, appreciate uh, something that is going to benefit us. So it's more likely for a child to perceive a piece of fruit, an apple, 
much more quickly than they might perceive a rock or a blade of grass. We're more likely to perceive something when we need it. What we believe can affect what we perceive. Yeah. Emotions such as fear can influence perceptions of sensory information. Okay. So if we believe that something is dangerous, even though it may not be, um, that emotion of fear can cause our perception of something we see, for example, something we hear, for example, to uh, cause us to put our guard up because we think that is a dangerous thing. Expectations based on previous experiences can influence perception. So something has happened to us in the history of our life at that point, and we expect that to be true again. It was true then, so it's going to be true in the future would be our conclusion based upon that experience, uh, even though so. Let me give you an example of that. Ex expectations based on previ previous <sighs> previous experiences can influence perception. Okay, okay. So, and this will hit home with many of you simply because statistically it generally does. So, in fourth grade, third grade, fifth grade, whatever, you started having negative experiences with arithmetic and you just couldn't understand it, period, you began to avoid it. Now you're in college and the advisor is telling you you've got to take it uh, in order to get your, your degree, but your previous experiences with arithmetic slash math gives you the expectation that I'm going to have the same horrid experience now that I had then. Therefore, how important is it really for me to keep uh, staying in school if I have to go through that pain again? Furthermore, I'm thoroughly convinced I won't do well in it. I'm going to flunk it, so drop out now. And the problem with that thinking is, let me make it extremely elementary. The problem with that thinking is, back up to when you were four years old, let me just pretend you were four when grandma taught you to tie your shoe. If Back then, Grandma hadn't taken you step by step to learn how to do it. And with practice after practice after practice, you got better and better and better so that it became second nature to you. Likewise, the example could have gone for learning to write your name. You have to even learn which direction the S is pointed which direction you know you have to learn basic stuff but after a while it became second nature to you okay fourth grade fifth grade third grade math was hard it scared you you threw up your hands and gave up now you're in college rather than immersing yourself in the fear of I'm bad at math I'll never get it I'm not going to try. Okay, yes, I went to tutoring even, but I didn't understand what the guy was saying to me, so I'm really dumb, so I'm going to quit college. To say that is really dumb. All you need to do is realize that 
2 plus 2 is no harder, let me back up, calculus, algebra, is no harder than 2 plus 2 if you take it a step at a time, lining up the shoestring to make it even is step one, uh, learning which direction the letter S goes in writing your name is step one. Going to the tutor as many times as is necessary is step one. Realizing that you have a dream in life to, to ultimately end up in a career that requires a degree or two is step one. So don't do what so many students do, and that is throw out the baby with the bathwater, throw out the, um, you know, opportunity for a good life based upon, back to the screen now, based upon expectations that are based on previous experiences that you allow to influence your perception. So psychological and uh, cultural influences. Uh, on our perception. So it's all about needs, beliefs, emotions, and expectations. One culture will produce a higher number, higher percentage of college graduates than another culture. Why? Because that culture realizes there are needs of not living in poverty, and the needs include education. So at all costs, that culture uh, does what they need to do to get the child early in life started on a trajectory towards um, their brain being utilized in a forward-moving way, learning and mo uh, more and more learning, using it, not losing it. Uh, the beliefs factor into that. The emotions factor into that. The expectations factor into um, our perception of how to have the best life that we can have. Culture also shapes our stereotypes, directs our attention, tells us what to notice as well as what to ignore. So, perception is not always totally conscious. We perceive some things subliminally. And that's frankly what advertising is all about. Subliminal persuasion, excuse me. So, stimuli that are so weak or brief that they are below a person's absolute threshold for detecting them. Uh, behavior can be affected by subliminal stimuli. However, it is difficult to demonstrate and replicate. I'll put all this into English in a minute. No evidence of subliminal persuasion in real life is what science says, uh, and there's little cause, therefore, to worry about being manipulated. Okay, what that is saying is that you and I are affected our perception is, per, is affected to greater or lesser degree, I personally think greater, by 
okay, they're showing this popcorn. Not a word is being said about popcorn in that bunch of bullet points there. Uh, you can't really smell it. You know what it is by looking at it, but the subliminal work that's going on in looking at this page is powerful. So when they say, when they say there that stimuli are so weak or brief that they're below your absolute threshold to detect them, that is not true of that popcorn. The stimuli is very strong. You can smell it in your head right now. You are probably going to go get yourself some popcorn before the day's over, you know? So a, there are stimuli in the environment that cause you to develop a desire for for it. It's subliminal. I know you're happy to see this page because it's the last page. Taking psychology with you. Uh, extrasensory perception, is that reality or is that illusion? Extrasensory perception is sending and receiving messages about the world without relying on the usual sensory channels to do it. Uh, well, science can't scientifically demonstrate extrasensory perception, but you either believe in it or you don't. And if you believe in it, you believe in it because you either have it or you have experienced it from someone else toward you. You sensed something, some communication was coming your way from another individual, or you were able to send information to another individual out of yourself, from within yourself. Or you've heard um, people say, I just heard it on TV last night most recently, uh, a mother saying with regard to her missing daughter, I believe it was missing daughter, at any rate, a missing child, son or daughter, uh, that she suddenly felt the overwhelming need to cry. She felt a sense of extreme heaviness, and she did not know why. She wasn't otherwise depressed or sad about anything. And she later found out that that was the very point at which her daughter was being... Um, uh, was being kidnapped uh, and molested and killed. They ultimately found the daughter's body. And through, uh, you know, police work and, and so forth, they found that that is exactly what the mother felt, although she didn't know at the time that that was why she was crying. So, you know. You either believe in it or you don't, but there you go. Okay, this is it. Thank you for your listening ears, and uh, we'll see you when I get back.